Hey, good morning, church. Hope everyone's doing good. Would you come to your feet and let us praise our God and rejoice in his love and that his love never fails. Oh, 
Hey, before being seated, would you just turn around and say good morning to each other? All right, well, good morning. My name is Dave. I'm one of the pastors. So glad that you are here to join us for worship in the worship center in the family room next door. Uh, and those of you joining us online, wherever you may be, so glad that we can all be together in these different ways. Uh, you know, uh, if you've been tracking with the news coming out of Turkey and Syria, your, your heart is probably pretty heavy this morning, just the, uh, the numbers of deaths that we're hearing from the earthquake. And so we want to take a moment uh, and just pray. Let's pray together, and then I've got a few thoughts on how we can respond as a church. So will you pray with me? Father God, our hearts are heavy to hear of, of the devastation, of the loss of life and the suffering. Uh, and God, we pray, Lord, that you would preserve as many lives as possible, Lord, those that are still awaiting rescue. Uh, God, that you would be with those who are uh, injured, who are um, suffering and in pain. God, that you would be with those who have lost loved ones there. Lord, we pray that, uh, you know, a red tape would not get in the way. God, we pray that, you know, uh, ongoing disasters would not get in the way, Lord, aftershocks or whatever it may be. Uh, but Lord, that you're, you would help. God, we just call out for help. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, when, when, when things like this happen, when natural disasters like this happen, and they're so far away, there are still ways that we can respond and we can help. One is we can continue to pray. I know you will do that because I, I know who you are. So we'll continue to pray for the people that are affected by this. Um, and we can also partner with people that are there, right? We have mission partners in the area, uh, some that we work closely with, some that we are more just kind of friends with. And we just want you to know that if you are so inclined and you're like, man, I want to help, I obviously can't go there to help, but I can, I can donate. Um, there is, you can donate through Stafford Crossing and every penny of that will go to a partner that's working in the region and helping. And when you do your online giving or if you write it on an envelope, just write Turkey Syria Relief and we'll make sure that it gets there. But let's continue to pray for them because these things break God's hearts as much as, or more than it does our hearts. Uh, he hates to see things like this happen. And, and he's calling his people to come alongside and help in, in, in a lot of different ways. So you can respond as the Lord leads you for that. All right. I um, also want to just say in, in, in welcoming you, uh, point all of us to the digital bulletin, that that is a place of key information, f uh, things going on in the life of the church, but also ways to communicate back to the church of, hey, this is going on in my life. And, you know, that's happening way across the world. But here's what's happening in my life. I'd love some prayer about this as well. And so we would just welcome any communication from you. If you're new, a special welcome to you. Uh, we'd love to know that you're here, to know your name and maybe an email address or some way that we could reach out and say, so glad that you came today. Uh, even if you're watching online, so glad that you're watching online today. Um, and, and that's all in the digital bulletin, and you can uh, just communicate that way. There's also links for giving, for sermon notes. There's a really great link in the sermon resource that we'll talk about later that you'll want to pay attention to this week. Uh, you'll be so glad that you did, so you can check that out. Um, but in the, this is not in the digital bulletin, but there are no, there are no fusion activities going on tonight. Uh, our, our amazing youth pastor is down sick. And so that just kind of throws a monkey wrench in everything. So we're just going to say there's no fusion tonight. Uh, if you're a student, don't come here. All right. Also, we're, we're approaching Easter, right? And, and, and in the approach of Easter is called the Lenten season, L-E-N-T, not L-I-N-T, right? The Lenten season. And it's just a, a time of reflection and focusing on, on the sacrifice of Jesus. There are resources on the at-home wall, which is in the lobby. And I'm guessing that they're also on the website, growfaithathome.org. Uh, you can check those out if you want to engage in Lent, L-E-N-T, this season coming up towards Easter. Uh, and then at the end of the month, I'm super excited about this, is a workshop or a conference, whatever you want to call it. It's called, I said this, you heard that. Have you ever been in those conversations where you're saying one thing and the other person's hearing something different or vice versa? And that almost always leads to a negative uh, circumstance, right? And uh, just how do we avoid that? How do I hear better what you're saying? And how do I communicate better what I'm really trying to say? Uh, so this is, this is not just for married people, not just for parents. This is for human beings that need to communicate with other human beings. 
And so we hope that you can do that. So Friday night and Saturday morning, uh, there's activities on Saturday morning for the kids. So check that out, information there. Sign up ends next week. Uh, so we're coming up on that one as close. And then uh, on March 5th, we have baptism. It's one of our baptism services. There are um, information meetings on the 19th and the 26th that you'll want to be a part of just as that process of getting baptized. But super excited for people to take that step of publicly identifying themselves with Jesus Christ, saying, I, I, I'm in, I am all in with Jesus, and I'm going to get in this tank in front of all of these people to make that known, right? It's a beautiful thing to see. It's great to celebrate that, and we're excited for that. Information's on the website. Be sure to sign up for that. We are wrapping up better decisions and fewer regrets. So after today, there will be no more bad decisions. Stop it. All right, we're done with that. And, and no regrets, and we'll get to that in just a moment. But let's stand and let's continue to worship our great God today. And 
felt like a burden But once I could grasp it You took me further Further than I was asking Oh, it's simple to see you It's worth it all My life is an altar your fire fall if you say it's wrong then i'll say no if you say release i'm letting go if you're in it with me i'll be in when you say to jump i'm diving in if you say be still then i will wait if you say to trust i will obey i don't want to fight my own ways I'm done chasing feelings Spirit lead me And when all hope is gone water from the rocks to satisfy my thirst and to love me at my worst and even when I don't remember you remind me of my word I don't trust my ways I'm trading in my thoughts I've laid down everything It's cause you're all that I want I've landed on my knees This is the cup you have for me And even when it don't make sense I'm gonna let your spirit say release I'm letting go if you're in it with me I'll begin and when you say to jump I'm diving in if you say be still then I will wait if you say to trust I will obey you're the only truth the light the way I'm done chasing feelings spirit So we're introducing a new song today, and it uses this image of a fire that's burning inside of us. Um, Now, I was kind of thinking about fire. I don't know that much about fire, but I do know that if uh, a fire isn't contained, it can spread, and that's usually um, not a very good thing. Um, A fire not being contained is usually a bad thing. But when we sing of the fire that God sparks in our hearts, It's a good thing when that fire burns and spreads throughout our lives and to those around us. And so with this song, um, we're going to ask that the fire that God has started in our hearts would burn brighter and that he would fan that flame. There's a power that's made perfect in my weakness fills me up with a strength that is fearless i find hope within your everlasting promise it fans my faith into flame i'm living with a fire Shine bright. 
again. Man, I'm excited for this message. As we wrap up better decisions and fewer regrets, I think this has been a great way to start off this year, right? This has just been uh, very positive for us. But if you think about it, this whole messed up world, everything that goes wrong, and even the natural disasters that we were talking about earlier, can all be traced back to one bad decision. One poor decision has created all the regrets in this world. And ever since then, humans have been making poor decision after poor decision and just creating more and more regret in this world and in our lives. And we, we would really like to change that. We would really like to interrupt that cycle and change that outcome as much as possible, right? And so in this series, we've, we've been exploring questions that we can ask ourselves 
in our decisions that will lead us, hopefully, to better decisions so that we're experiencing fewer regrets. And if we answer these questions honestly, and then if we act on that honest answer to those questions, then we have a much greater chance of making good decisions rather than bad decisions and, 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 and living with less regret in our lives. And so just as a quick review, we've gone through four questions already, and there was a bookmark in the a bookmark size card there in the sermon notes when you came in. It's also available online. You can download it or print it uh, and see it that way. Uh, if you didn't get one, we'll have some extra copies out in the lobby after the service. But these, this is just something to take with you, maybe to give to a friend, just to help you remember. Uh, and you can put it somewhere that you'll have it with you. But the first question is called the integrity question. And we're asking, in this, in this decision, am I being honest with myself, right? And we, we learned that we are masters at l- lying to ourselves. We can sell ourselves the worst lie, and we believe it like that. Uh, and so we deceive ourselves. Am I being honest in what I want in this decision? Secondly was the legacy question. What st- will I tell a story that I'm proud to tell? Our lives are written, the story of our lives is written one decision at a time. You know, and, and, and as I make this decision, what story do I want my life to tell? to the people around me. Third question was the conscience question. Is there a tension that deserves my attention, right? And this tension mechanism is is the uh, alarm that God has given us that alerts us to potentially poor decisions. As we're considering this or that, this response or that response, and that alarm begins to ding, that's that mechanism that that God has given us in our brains and and through his spirit to say, hey, time out. This is going to be a bad decision. And so we have this conscience that we can pay attention to. For followers of Jesus, that's even heightened by his presence with us and his voice speaking to us as we learn to listen to him. And then we have the last week, we talked about the maturity question. What is the wise thing to do? And this is so important for us to get because just because something is legal, just because something is acceptable, even just because it's morally okay, doesn't mean it's the wise thing to do in every given circumstance. And so we have to, as Ephesians 5 tells us, you know, be careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. Be wise in how you live and how you make your decisions. Because pretty safe to say the better decision is usually the wise one. If you throw wisdom out, you're probably going to be in in poor decision land for a while. Now, these these are powerful questions, but remember, this is not a self-help. This is not about inner power that, boy, if you just ask these questions, then you're going to discover some great power within you to make better decisions and be, be smarter and all that kind of stuff. This is about jesus fuel transformation. It's about putting ourselves in a position where we can hear from God, where we can hear from God's word, we can hear his voice in our lives, we can hear from other believers helping us and guiding us in our decision making. And it has been so strategic to spend time on this at the beginning of this year, and has been so helpful. And you don't have to take my word for it. Uh, last week, Daryl said, hey, tell us some stories, right? And we had a survey where you could, you could just enter anonymously your stories of how these questions have helped you make better decisions already this year. And there were some amazing stories shared with us, so many to the point that we cannot cover, we're, we can't take time to even explore them this morning. So we've created a web page on our, our, our website where you can just read through. And there's a link in the sermon notes to there where you can read the stories and they will amaze you. They will inspire you and encourage you. They're stories of sobriety decisions, like in the moment. It's like, hey, I felt some tension about not taking drugs. And so I didn't. Like, I'm like, whoa, that's pretty powerful. Uh, there are stories of parenting decisions and family decisions, stories of difficult relationship decisions. Well, you know, putting distance from a toxic person, just incredible stories of how God has been at work. And we we love, we love seeing the evidence of God, the evidence of God at work, because this is, this is all God here uh, as we hear these stories, as we celebrate what he is doing. So take time, not right now, but take time later to read the stories and to hear what God is doing in different people's lives. All right, he's growing us and he's guiding us and we're making better decisions already and experiencing less regret. Well, that's where we've been, all right? Those four questions. And let's just say, if we just stopped there, like you, your life would be better off. You would be making better decisions if we just stopped there and, and you really embraced those four questions. We're already heard or are hearing stories of the impact from just those four questions. 
but we're not done. We've got one more. We've got one more question today. And this last question is different than the first four. All right, so we have to shift our gears mentally for this. The first four pretty much have a built-in guarantee of benefit. If you ask those first four questions, whether you trust in Jesus or not, whether you believe any of this, if you just ask yourself these questions, you're probably going to make better decisions. All right? The only thing you really risk is not getting to do what you initially wanted to do. You might, if you ask these four questions in your decision making, you might have to bail on your desire and go a different way, but it's going to be a better way. All right, so there's built-in benefit. There's really not a lot of risk to those four, first four questions, but this last question is different. There is no built-in guarantee of benefit for you. In fact, the odds are better than average. If you ask this question, if you apply this last question, it will cost you something in the equation. And you may be thinking, well, then I just won't ask that question. I'm, I'm good with four. Like four out of five, that's pretty good, right? But consider this. What you don't know can still hurt you. If you do not ask this last question, you will not know the answer to it. And if you do not know the answer to it, you cannot make a better decision based on that information. And so if you don't know the answer to this last question, it can hurt you. And not only you, it can hurt the people around you in a greater way. You see, this last question is significantly tied to the people around us. And you remember, our decisions, no matter how personal they may be, even private decisions, rarely does the impact remain isolated to us. But our decisions, even private personal decisions, ripple out from us to impact those around us. And so this last question has the potential to enhance and enrich every relationship in your life. It might cost you something, probably will, but it can enhance and enrich every relationship and every person around you. And I think that committing to this question, even more than all the others combined, can have the greatest impact on your decision-making and leading to less regret. But I should, you should know this as we get into this. This question, this last question, leans heavily towards the follower of Jesus. The first four questions, it doesn't matter if you believe in Jesus or not. That's just, it's just good decision-making wisdom. Apply it, live, live a happier life. This last one, the most powerful question, is really uh, leans heavily for followers of Jesus because uh, it, it, the source of it comes from Jesus. All right. So if you don't have Jesus in your life, none of us are able to do this on our own. And if you don't have Jesus in your life, you're, you're really limited. All right, you'll, you'll be able to spark it every now and then, but not consistently. And that's just not good enough, I think, and, and, and what we're wanting to experience in our lives. But if you're in that place, you're like, well, pff, well, I'm not a follower of Jesus. This is dumb, right? Just listen in. Don't tune out. Because by the time we're done, you may just want to take that step and put your trust in Jesus today. And we want you to have that opportunity. So listen in. But we get this final question directly from Jesus' teachings. All throughout his, his teaching ministry, it's recorded in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the New Testament, uh, there are hints and, and, and teachings that Jesus was doing something new. He was bringing something new to this world, new to the people. And uh, there he told uh, you know, parables or stories that outlined something new. The teachings that he gave did not sound like typical Jewish religious teachings, right? And one of his famous teachings, we call it Sermon on the Mount because he was on a hillside. Uh, and, he, and he kept saying things like, you've heard it said this, but I tell you this instead. Like, you've heard it said, don't commit murder. But I tell you, if you even hate somebody, you're guilty. You've heard it said, it's okay to hate your enemy, but I tell you, love your enemy instead, right? You've heard it said the old way, but I tell you the new way, and this is the way that we're going to go. Jesus told people that he says, listen, and this was very first century metaphors here. He says, listen, you don't put new wine in old wineskin, and you don't put a new patch on old material. They don't go together. And as that new wine ferments in that old wineskin, that old wineskin is going to burst. It can't handle it. And Jesus is saying, listen, I'm doing something new here, and the old way can't take it. The old way cannot contain what I'm introducing to this world. 
And this new way of Jesus will come to a climax over the last couple days of his life on earth. And it begins at a dinner party that we call the Last Supper. Jesus was celebrating the Passover meal. He knew it was his last Passover meal with his disciples. And uh, the Passover meal was a, a big time uh, you know, um, celebration and event in the Jewish religious calendar. And so he's having this meal with his disciples. During this meal time, it's where he washes the apostles' feet. And he teaches them. And he, he, he prays for them. And he prays for all of his future disciples, including us. And it's in this, in this intimate, powerful experience. And no matter how familiar you may be, I, I just challenge you, I encourage you, go back and read through John 13, chapters 13 through 17 this coming week. Be refreshed and be reminded of all of it because it it's, it's intense. But in this intimate dinner setting is where we find our last question for better decisions. And when we're going to read it in just a moment, and when I read it, for some of you, it may be new. You may be like, wow, that's pretty significant. Others, you may feel a little bit deflated because you're like, ah, oh, I've heard that before. And, and it, it's right. You have heard this before. I'm not going to unearth something that no one has ever said or heard from Jesus before this morning. But let me challenge us to not let the familiarity make us numb to the significance of what Jesus wants to say to us. Because his words here should, should rock us. His words should have an outside, an outsized, a disproportionate impact on everything we do, every decision that we make. So let's read John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35. Jesus says, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. All right, so here's the final question. You've probably read it on the card already. But what does love require of me? What does love require of me? It's so, such a simple question, so basic, and yet astonishingly challenging when we try to live this way. And it's nothing short of epic in our, in, on its impact in how we live if we embrace it. Because when our decisions are guided by love for others, we will experience the fewest regrets in life. Now, that's not to say there won't be hard things or painful things in life, but regrets won't necessarily be a part of that hardship or that pain. So this morning, I want to dig deeper into Jesus' words here in John chapter 13, but then I also want to look at a very familiar passage that I think is misunderstood and, uh, and, and to discover, how do we answer this question? What does love require of me? That's a simple question, but what, uh, that's a really difficult and complex answer. And we want to find that answer. So to better understand Jesus's words, let's dissect what he said first, right? In verse 34, he says, listen, a new command I give you, a new command. Now that word new, that has different shades of meaning, right? And I think we all understand this. When I buy a toothbrush, I have a certain high level expectation of its newness as compared to like buying a lawnmower. I don't care if someone else has used that lawnmower. But I don't want anyone else to have used that toothbrush when I buy it. N no teeth have touched that brush except my own. That's, that has, that's a different category of new, right? And then the original writing, the original language of the Bible writers, there were different words for new. And the word that they used here expresses quality or kind, not just another ad addition. So Jesus is not saying, hey, I've got another command to the list. Instead of 10 commandments, we got 11 now. Or instead of 600, 601, whatever it is, I'm not adding to the list. I'm starting a new list over here because I've got a new way. And it's going to be in this new model and this new mode, this new covenant. And I've got a new command for this. And that new command is to love one another. A new command I give you, love one another. Now, if we just stop there for a second, that's not exactly new. Like, Jesus isn't saying anything new or groundbreaking here. And in the law of Moses, in the old way, in Leviticus 19, uh, it already says, love your neighbor uh, as yourself, right? That's what Jesus quoted in Matthew when the religious leaders were saying, hey, what's the most important law, Jesus? And he said, well, the most important is to love the Lord your God with your whole being. And he said, bonus, the second one, love your neighbor as yourself. So that's not new, to love others, but then Jesus goes on, and he, and he qualifies it, and he says, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. 
love like Jesus has loved us. How has Jesus loved us? Well, he left heaven. He left that perfect place of of purity and holiness, and he came to live on this earth in the first century to be one of us, to be among humanity. For these disciples, these apostles, he chose them when they had been passed over by everybody else. No one one had picked them for kickball, right? They were fishing. But Jesus came to them and he said, follow me. And then he put up with them. As you read the Gospels, these guys were knuckleheads. Like all of their foolishness, all of their mistakes, all of their arguing with each other, everything, they, they wanted to call down fire from heaven on people to destroy them. Jesus put up with all of that because he loved them. And then, just moments before he gives them this command, in a scandalous moment, Jesus gets down on his knees and washes their feet. That's what what the lowest servant, the lowest person, like below the bottom rung on the ladder, that's what that servant did. But Jesus put himself in that place. They wouldn't know this as Jesus was talking, but in less than 24 hours, he would be hanging on a cross. Blood. And his life leaving him because he loved him. Jesus said, this is my command. Love people the way I have loved you. Now the Apostle Paul, who was not at the dinner party because he came to trust in Jesus later. The Apostle Paul, writing to the Corinthian Christians, uh, tried to unpack this command for them. Jesus said, love people like like I love people. Well, what does that look like? How do the Corinthians do that? How do we love people the way Jesus loved people? Now, sadly, I think these verses have largely been relegated to uh, wedding ceremonies. If you had these in your wedding, don't feel bad about that. It was still good. But when we understand that this is not about happily ever after, but this is a describing an, an explicit and deeply sacrificial life of love for others, it changes it a little bit. Read with me in 1 Corinthians 13. We'll pick up in verse 4. What does loving like Jesus look like? Well, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. And when we can get the wedding bells out of our mind as we read through these verses, that's incredibly challenging. Incredibly challenging. Just think, if we always made the patient decision or the kind decision, the non-envious decision, the humble decision, the honorable decision, the selfless decision, the not angry decision, the non-grudge holding decision, the honest decision, the protective decision, the trusting and hope-filled decision, the never giving up decision. If we always made those decisions, we would never regret anything again because we would be loving others like Jesus has loved. Again, this is not going to make life pain-free or problem-free, but we can be free of regret. See, Jesus, Jesus had a fair amount of problems. He had a whole lot of pain on the cross but he had no regret. He had no regret as he walked in obedience to God and loved like this for us. Now, I said uh, earlier that this was the most important question, right? This is the most important question of the five. So let me make that case of why this is true, because if it really is the most important question, then, then we need to really understand that and embrace this. Going back to Jesus's words in John chapter 13, look at verse 35 again. He says, by this... Everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. There are a lot of ways that, that marked the Jewish people in Jesus' day, right? You went to temple uh, to offer sacrifices. You were faithful to go to synagogue. Uh, you would wear certain things. They had tassels, prayer tassels that they would wear on their hymns. They had these little boxes called phylacteries that they would put scripture in. It's kind of like an like a awkward-looking locket, and they would wear and carry the scripture around with them, right? Uh, they would observe the Sabbath rules. If you were a guy, you had to be circumcised. So there, there were definite markers of what it meant to be Jewish. And, and, and Jesus' disciples would understand that. And Jesus is saying, listen, here is the expectation. Here is the marker of my people. I'm doing a new thing. Right? The prayer tassels and the sacrifices, that's the old way. Here's the new way. 
if you love one another. Not even like you love yourself. You love others like I love you. This is the marker of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Here is how people will know that you're truly mine. If you love people like I do. Because for, for, for humanity, that's weird. That's abnormal. It has to come from God. Flipping back to 1 Corinthians 13, Paul is trying to make this point to them in the first verses of the chapter. He says, listen, if I speak in the tongues of men or angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give, my, give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. In other words, all of those spiritual markers, all of those things that you think make you a spiritual giant, if you don't have love, you're nothing. I don't care how big your faith is if you're not loving. I don't care how much you know if you don't have love in your heart for others. If you're not loving like Jesus has loved, that's why this is the most important question because it forces us, it brings us to that point of asking, am I loving like Jesus? What is the, the loving like Jesus decision in this circumstance or with this person? It's the most important part of our relationship with others and with God. And in many ways, Answering this question is also the answer to a lot of unknown things in our spiritual lives. When, when I don't know which path to take, I've got a decision to make, and, 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 and I've got two, maybe three good options here that seem all right. What's the best option? Well, which one is the most loving to the most people? Or I don't know how to respond to this person over here. Like, I've just never had that circumstance. What response expresses the most love to that person? And it can answer those questions for us. Now, to some, this may sound like a recipe for just being a doormat, right? Well, that's just, people are just going to walk all over me. If I'm just always doing the loving thing to them and not, you know, defending myself or standing up for myself, they're just going to suck the life out of me. That sounds terrible. I don't want to ask this question. But as is often the case with Jesus, his way is counterintuitive to our experience or our expectations. Now, we, we focused on John chapter 13 but Jesus repeated this command over in John chapter 15, and, and he adds a little detail to it. But you look in verse 10 through 12. He says, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete or a full abundant. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Did you follow the sequence? He says, listen, keep my commands. If you keep my commands, then you will know the full joy of the Lord. And by the way, here's the command. Love others the way I have loved you. Love others the way I have loved you, and the joy of the Lord will be yours. This is the secret that followers of Jesus know. That what looks like a, a recipe for disaster of just being a doormat and, and being taken advantage of is really the secret to the best life the best way of living life, that we can know the joy of the Lord as we follow his commands, and his command is to love others as he has loved us. Now, earlier, I said that the first four questions, they benefit anyone, right? But followers of Jesus uh, really have the advantage on this last question, because it's not in us as humans to love the way that Jesus loved. Jesus is the source code of this love. And to know that, to, to be able to express that and to give that to others, we have to have his presence with us. We have to be connected to him. And so maybe you're hearing this message and you're realizing, I, I need Jesus. And I want Jesus in my life because I want to be able to live that way. Maybe you've experienced that love from someone else and you're like, I want to do that too. I want to have Jesus in my life. Well, this is a great opportunity Let's just apply these five questions to the decision. Should, should we trust in Jesus, right? Am I being honest with myself? Am I being honest with myself about the decision to trust in Jesus? Because I've been telling myself that I'm good enough already, that I'm not as bad as those people over there or that person over there. I'm good enough. Am I being honest? Because no one's good enough for God. What about what story do I want to tell? 
Will I tell the story of a radically transformed and better and healthier life through the power of Jesus? Or will I continue to tell the story of nothing changing? Same old dysfunction, same old poor decisions, same old hurts and habits and hang-ups. Or will I tell a better story through the power of Jesus? What about, is there a tension that deserves my attention? If you're in that place where you haven't trusted in Jesus, maybe you're considering that and you kind of feel that knot in your gut, that's God. That's God reaching out and saying, hey, this is for you today. That tension that you're feeling is the Spirit of God saying, I want you to trust in Jesus. Will you lean into that? Will you explore that tension? Will you uh, pay attention to it or will you just ignore it? What about the wisdom question? What's the wise thing to do? So just, just given everything that we understand about God and everything that we see of him and, and we hear the stories of, of his amazing power to change lives, is it wiser to accept him or reject him? I mean, to me, it seems like an obvious question, but you have to reach that conclusion for yourself. And lastly, what does love require of me? Now, we have to, we have to twist it just a little bit, the focus of it. When I'm asking that about decisions between us, I'm asking, how should I love you? But when we're talking with God, when we're considering God, it's not, how, how should I love God in this decision, but it's, will I receive God's love in this decision? Will I accept it? You see, God has loved you more than anyone else ever will in this world, in this universe. And he has loved you before you ever had love for him. You cannot love God except that he has already loved you. So what does love require of me? Love requires me to accept God's love, to receive his love in my life. And see, we don't really turn to God because we feel guilty or because we're afraid of hell. We turn to God because we see his goodness. We turn to God because he has loved us. And even though we did not know we needed it, he made a way of escape for us before we ever turned to him. And so if you've not trusted in Jesus, you've not made the best decision. We've been talking about better decisions. You haven't made the best decision yet. But today you can. The good news is you don't need uh, any special help. You don't need anyone to hold your hand or to pray for you. There, there are no special words you have to say, right? Just even in the silence of your own heart and mind, you can acknowledge your need for God, your, for God's forgiveness, that, yep, I've done some stuff, and I need to be forgiven for that stuff. And I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he lived on this earth. He, he died on the cross. And I don't understand this part, but God raised him from the dead, and he's alive today. I don't understand that yet, but I believe it, and I accept it. And as I express these things to God, I ask for your forgiveness. Will you take away my sin? And God has promised the moment that we express these things to him, he will forgive us. He will make us new. And we can begin a new life with him. If you make that choice, if you make that decision to put your trust in Jesus, the best decision, then let somebody know. Maybe it's a family member, a friend, a neighbor. Um, you know, if you're watching this down the road online, uh, it, can, it doesn't matter. Tell someone so that they can come alongside you, they can celebrate, and they can begin this journey with you. As a church, we'd love to know, right? And, and, and uh, we don't have to know, but we would love to, so we can pray for you and provide resources uh, and begin that journey with you. Uh, and you can do that on the, the tear-off card if you're here in person online. Uh, there's a link in the sermon notes where you can let us know that you made this decision as well. But we're so grateful, so grateful that God has brought us through this teaching series for our church family we're thrilled. We love hearing the stories. And we know that stories are going to continue to be written through better decisions. As we live the lives of renovators, allowing God to tear things down, as we live the, the lives of, of guides with one another, helping us navigate and make decisions, right? We're, we're building a community that chooses to give our best each day to trust and follow Jesus as we make better decisions that lead to fewer regrets. Let's pray. Father God, Thank you so much for your love and your grace today. Lord, that you can bring us to a place where we make better decisions. God, what does love require of us? God, you have shown such great love to us. How do we live that out? God, because we are not good at it. Lord, may you fill us with your spirit. Help us to know, to, to ask that question and to discover the answer in our decisions. What does love require of me? God, we pray for those who are maybe at this moment, making that decision to trust in you or considering it, God, may you just meet them where they're at and 
fill them with your presence, God. May they just have that, that intangible sense of you and your joy and your forgiveness that all, all of the stuff from the past is gone and replaced with your love and your grace. God, be with us all as we move forward. We want to make better decisions to honor you better, um, to glorify you with fewer regrets. In Jesus' name. Thanks, Dave. So let's come to our feet, and we're going to sing one last time, um, singing that our God is worthy to build our life on.
you so much for joining us today. I uh, hope you have a great week and fun time watching the Super Bowl tonight. Uh, go Chiefs. And uh, <laughs> just remember our, uh, our ushers will be at the door. So if you have any uh, ties, offerings, or connection cards, you can leave them there. And uh, yeah, go Chiefs. <laughs> have a good one.